What does it mean for you as a parent when your child does bad? Hey everybody, this is Pastor Justin Walker with The Whole Truth. We're going through the entire Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation, and we're not skipping anything. I want you to come along with me. You can do that by turning your Bible open to Genesis chapter 26 and verse 34. And while you do that, reach down and hit the subscribe button and share the video. It helps it to go further. And I think today's video might be a help to some people. And so I want you to stick along through the video. It's just two little short verses today. Look at this, Genesis 26 and 34. And we're going to talk about when a child is wayward or when a child is doing bad. What does that mean for the parent? Look at Genesis chapter 26 and verse 34, when Esau was 40 years old, he took as wives Judith, the daughter of Barai, the Hittite, and Basimath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. And they were grie, and they were a grief to the of the mind. Let me just read that line again. And they were a grief of the mind of Isaac and Rebekah. Now, a couple of elements that I want to get across first, and then we're going to get to the practical application. I want you to notice, first of all, that Esau was 40 years old. If you do your math, that makes Isaac 100. Isaac was 60 when he had Esau and Jacob, the twin brothers. And Esau, from the beginning, God had told Rebekah that Esau was going to serve Jacob. The older was going to serve the younger. In other words, the promised blessing that Abraham, Isaac, it wasn't going to be Abraham, Isaac, Esau. It was going to be Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Okay. And then we saw Esau sold his birthright to Jacob. He was a worldly man and he wasn't concerned with things like a birthright. And so he sold his birthright to to Jacob. You can go back and watch that video about the birthright. Uh, I've got a video about that. And so here's now Esau at 40 years old and Isaac is 100 years old. This is a grown man. 40 years old, and he goes out and he takes two wives. That's the problem. He shouldn't have taken two wives. Just because the Bible tells us what someone did doesn't mean that it's telling us it's okay to do it. God's not telling us it's okay to take multiple wives. He's saying that Esau took multiple wives. And so Esau took multiple wives. That was not good. That was bad. He should not have done that. And not only did he take multiple wives, but he took them from the Hittite nation. Now you have to remember, go all the way back in the Bible to the line of Seth, and men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Okay, so there's this group of men who have been calling on the name of the Lord, and that goes all the way down to Noah. And then Noah has sons, and one of those sons, Ham, he becomes the Canaanite people, and they become a rebellious people, a sinful people. And then you've got the line of Shem. That's the line that continues to call on the name of the Lord. And so we're now to Isaac. We've worked our way. I skipped a whole lot of generations there, but these people have been calling on the name of the Lord. Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Isaac, his son, called on the name of the Lord. Now, Esau, his son, should call on the name of the Lord, but he just took two wives from pagan nations. And at 40 years old, when he took two wives from pagan nations, it grieved his parents. Isaac and Rebekah, in their old age, are grieved by what their son Esau is doing. Well, there's a couple of things that I want to say to this. Number one, the first thing I want to say is this. When your children do wrong, when your children do bad, it is natural for us to feel ashamed or hurt or grieved or be bothered by. These are our children and we want what is best for them. And when we see our children doing something that is not good, that is bad or that is wrong or that is sinful or that's just not good for their home or not good for their future, it's upsetting to us. And that's a natural feeling. Uh, Isaac and Rebecca, they were grieved by it. Now you notice that they didn't go in and do something stupid. They didn't sever the relationship with Esau and say they'll never speak to Esau again because Esau was doing wrong. They didn't do that. They, you don't have to go to an extreme with this. They were grieved, but he's still their son. And I would remind you of the same, that your children are still your children. It's still your son. It's still your daughter, even if they have done wrong. It also doesn't mean that the wrong that they're doing is okay. I know a lot of people that when I speak of some particular sin, now I'm going to just avoid using an example right here and say that I might talk about a particular sin, and I regularly have someone message me or call me or write me, and they tell me that, well, my son or my daughter is fill in the blank, and it's one of those sins that I discussed. And they're using it as a way to justify the sin, like the sin is okay because their daughter or their son does it, and it doesn't go that way. And when I say it that way, it seems so plain, but when you're the one saying, well, my daughter's a 
fill in the blank, you know, whatever that is. I don't mean to sound derogatory there, but, but you know, that's my daughter. That's what she is, as if somehow that made it okay because your daughter is that thing. It doesn't make the sin okay. It is okay for you to love your child who also has sinned or is doing wrong. Both of those can happen at the same time. You can say, I don't like what you're doing, but I still love you. And that is okay. Now, I'm going to tell you a personal story of mine, and I want to be careful with my words here. But I have, I have um, children. I have six children. And my oldest daughter is, uh, she's an adult now. She's 20, she'll be 25 this year. And I know you look at me and think, oh my, he has a 25 year old. But I do, I have, uh, my oldest daughter is going to be 25. And my oldest daughter and I, we are working on our relationship and I love her dearly. But there was a time when um, we were struggling in our home and a, a little old lady from the church came to me and she insinuated to me that I should no longer be the pastor of the church because of the things that my oldest daughter was doing. And I was devastated. And she came to me with scripture, scripture that said that the man who desires the office of bishop should rule his own house well. And she handed me that scripture and she basically told me that I I really wasn't fit to be a preacher. I wasn't fit to be a pastor because of the things that my daughter was doing. Now I can tell you that I've gone through a lot of struggles in being a pastor. And there has never been one that has made me question what I was doing or my calling as much as that that little old woman who came to me with that scripture about my daughter. Instead of coming to me to help me or to encourage me or edify me, she came to me to tell me that my daughter had been doing wrong and I should no longer be a pastor, or at least that was insinuation. She didn't come out and say those exact words, but she surely was implying that that's, I, I remember even saying to her, are you implying that I shouldn't be a pastor because of what my daughter is doing? And she pursed her lips and kind of looked down to the left and and it was a very upsetting moment for me to be told that I shouldn't be a pastor because because of what my daughter was doing. And I questioned, I mean, I prayed and I questioned, I said, Lord, should I, am I doing wrong? I mean, is, th- is this a sign that I'm not ruling my own house well? And my wife did something very wonderful. She's so very smart. And when I was telling her of that situation, she helped me through that when she reminded me of this. She said, Justin, did you ever think that maybe God gave us Rebecca? Maybe God gave us uh, this situation because we were the only ones who could handle it. Because we were the ones who would handle it. And she was right. You know, I cannot control what my what my child ultimately does, especially when they're an adult child. Still my child, but an adult. I don't mean that in a contradictory way. I mean that they're your child, but they're, but they're an adult. I can't, I can't be responsible for every element of that. I can only be responsible for the way that I raise my children. I raise them in the admonition of the Lord, trusting that God says, if you'll uh, raise your children, uh, we we raise our children correctly, and when they're older, they will not depart from it. I mean, that's uh, Proverbs 22 and 6, that, uh, that when they're old, they won't depart from it. And so we raise our children in the Lord, in the name of the Lord, and we try to raise our children right, but at some point, your child has to make their own decision. And I'm hopefully saying that to you to encourage you, to, to remind you that you might have a child who's doing something that you disagree with, or that's wayward, or that's wrong, or even that's sinful, and you're not doing wrong by, one, loving that child and keeping that child in your life. And you also, it doesn't necessarily mean that you did something wrong when you were raising them. At some point, your children become adults and they have to answer for themselves. Esau has to answer for himself. And we're seeing here that Esau, God made the right choice in saying that Isaac should have Jacob and Jacob should be the line that would that would bring forth the Messiah, not Esau, because Esau is heading towards pagan, a pagan lifestyle and a worldly lifestyle and not focusing on the Lord. Now, I'm not saying that the Lord based his decision because of some works that someone did. What I'm saying is that the Lord's decision was right. That's what I'm trying to say. And we can see that the Lord knew what was going to happen, and the Lord doesn't retract the blessing from Isaac. He doesn't say, well, Isaac, your seed no longer is going to be the blessed seed because of your son Esau. God doesn't doesn't blame or punish Isaac for this, the choice that Esau is making. And I hope that you can find an encouragement in that and remember that you answer for what you've done 
And that's what God will base your blessings off of. And that's what he will judge us off. When we're standing at the Bema seat and the Lord will try our works, he will try. He will, it says it will be like a refiner's fire and wood, hay, and stubble are going to be burned up, right? And that's what I'm talking about is that you're going to answer for the way you raised your children, not necessarily for the decisions that your children made, even with the way that you raised them. I hope that you guys found today's video as an encouragement to remember that you have a job as a parent to raise your children correctly. And sometimes our children don't always reciprocate what we've tried to raise them in. And so I hope you'll stick with me tomorrow as we get into Genesis chapter 27. I'll see you then.